Well, good morning. I think that that was just the right song to start with today, having that one added on at the end, because what a, what a great reason to come here in Thanksgiving today, that there is power in the blood, uh, that we have been invited into this place by God, and that there is power that's at work within each and every single one of us, and uh, it is God working all things for our good. He's working out our salvation in our lives. And so I, I hope that if, if 2020 ha- has given you anything to be thankful for, it's just a reminder that we go back to our salvation. Our, our salvation is found in Jesus Christ and Him alone. And so uh, we have that to be thankful for. No matter what else is going on around us, we can continue to go back to that and uh, just praise God for the power that's there. So with that, I just want to just say a word of happy Thanksgiving. It is hard to believe that it, we're already to this point. And some of you would say, no, it's felt like it's been three years uh, since the last Thanksgiving. But uh, we've, we've certainly been through a, a crazy time. But I, I invite you today, as you're uh, coming into this place to to take time just to uh, just to, to meditate upon the blessings that you have had, uh, e- even with everything that's happened this year, we can still find reasons to to practice gratitude and and to see that God is still continue to be at work. So find ways, uh, even if it's in your own uh, prayer time, as we get into the open worship a little bit later on, to to just say a word of thanksgiving back to God. Uh, I remember hearing a few months ago. Uh, a pastor that was saying, you know, if, if the only prayer we pray is thank you, then we've prayed enough. And so maybe maybe that's what you're here for today is just to take time to, to pray that prayer of thank you uh, before God. So we just invite you to do that today. I do want to share a thank you note that I received for our church family. It says, your kindness meant everything to me. Thanks again. And it says, thank you for all your thoughts and many, many prayers. And this is from Sherry, Denny, and Nate Pau. So we continue to lift up that family in our prayers as um, when she got a report back, it wasn't cancer, the, the ones that they were able to get. But we want to continue to pray over Sherry's recovery uh, as, as she's, um, she's, doing, she's recovering from the surgery and will still face radiation treatments. So let's, I'm going to add her to our, our prayer concern list for this morning. Um, the other announcements that I had today, there's a couple of things that I just want to draw, or a few things I want to draw your attention to in the vestibule. Um, there are new budget proposals for the 2021 year. We invite you to pick one of those up to see uh, kind of where we're looking at going as a church family. I invite you to uh, pay attention to that if you're on a committee, um, if you're a chair of a committee especially. I think you were supposed to already have said something to Judy or one of the finance members, but I uh, want to invite you to take, uh, be able to pick that up and uh, just get, be informed so that as we have discussions in December and hopefully we can get it approved in, in January to be in effect. Uh, so that's there. We have uh, placed the box for the Christmas card collection that the youth group's going to be doing. Uh, we invite you to bring your Christmas cards for church family and place them in there. And uh, the due date on that is December 16th. Uh, so please have them in here by December 16th so that they can be sorted and then be, uh, they will be given out. What is that Sunday? The 22nd, I think it is. 20th? I don't, I don't remember now. Anyway, it'll be the following Sunday, so December 16th. I know that that's the deadline uh, for, for having them in. And then there was a, a container in there. I just wanted to remind you about it. It kind of gets forgotten, but there is a, a container in the, in the vestibule for, uh, it says, Pennies for he- from Heaven. And we just want to invite you to participate in that. I feel like it can kind of get forgotten in the uh, middle of everything else. But there's a, it's a container that stayed back there. Uh, it's taken on different forms in the past. But there's a container back there that if you bring your pennies in, uh, they will go. And I think they actually go to the food pantry uh, to help buy food for, for families that are in need. And so it's just how, how often do we see pennies just thrown down on the ground? Uh, well, imagine if we just took the time to pick those up and we uh, realized, you know, I, I read before how they... Um, we should care about every single penny because it says in God we trust. And, and if we actually were to take and, and pick it up and acknowledge that that's on there, acknowledging that, that it's, it's present in there and that we can give it then to, to look after others. So uh, just invite you to do that. If you have pennies at home, consider bringing those and supporting that ministry as well. That's, uh, that's back there. So um, that's what I have as far as announcements today. Are there any other announcements we want to bring forward this morning?
Praise God for that. And we praise God for Dot and her presence in our community. Any others? If not, let's move into a time of prayer concerns and praises. And as I mentioned earlier, I went ahead and wrote Sherry Faust on our, our prayer list for this morning. But what are the others on your, your hearts this morning? Let's continue to remember Sandra Love. Because mm, she's been taken to hospice. Let's remember. And then let's remember Brittany and Brian. Oh, Carol Buckner. So let's continue to remember O. Carol Buckner and his wife, Carolyn. And who did you say that was? Cecilia. Cecilia Crowder. So let's remember Cecilia Crowder, who was on a, in a horse accident yesterday. Well, at this time, I want to invite you to stand, and we're going to go to God in prayer over these prayer concerns. Heavenly Father, we want to simply say thank you for uh, the, the many blessings that have been with us throughout the week. We acknowledge that we've mentioned several prayer concerns, but uh, before we even look at those, we want to just say thank you for every single day that we've been given, for every single interaction that we have been granted, for every moment that we have been able to walk about this planet that you've created. Lord, that there's uh, so much goodness, even uh, with colder weather, we... Um, we just are reminded that you you are above everything and you are in everything, that you have set this world in such a way that it continues to sustain us and it continues uh, to nourish us and, and to, to carry us forward. And so for those, that, uh, we give you thanks. Lord, we, we pray um, just over our time together today, as we have gathered for worship, we, we pray that you might meet with every person that's here, that our hearts would be open to receive what you have for us as we're here during this time, that we might accept your presence and, and we might carry your presence back out with us wherever we go, that everyone who, who meets us this week as we are, are gathering with family, as we go about our week and business and uh, do so many things throughout this week, we pray that others might see you within us and the difference that you've made. And Lord, we also want to take some time today to remember these prayer concerns. We acknowledge that there are several needs in our community. We pray for Sherry Faust that you will continue to, to heal her body and bring her restoration uh, from the surgery she received, Lord, that uh, she faces more treatments and things that after this uh, recovery. We, we pray that you will already be guiding her, her path and, and just strengthening her body. We pray, Lord, for Sandra Love as she's in hospice house at this point. We pray that you will give her comfort, that you will surround her family with such love and, and strength, and, and Lord, that you will remind them that you continue to uh, be their salvation, you continue to, to be their strength, you are their rock, and so we thank you for that. Father, we lift up Brittany and Brian to you, and we pray that you will meet every single need that they have, that you will uh, give them comfort, that you will give healing uh, to Brittany, that you will uh, be able to, to direct their path and get them uh, to the right people to help them. Lord, we pray for Oak Carol and Carolyn. We, we lift them up and pray for your continued uh, support of them, that you will uh, hold them up and you will keep them strong and meet their needs every single day. And then, Lord, for Cecilia Crowder, we pray uh, just for, for healing, that you will uh, watch over, over her and uh, protect her from any further injuries that might complicate what's, uh, what's happening now from, from this horse accident. Uh, so we just lift her up. We thank you that um, for each of these and so many other things that we, we could mention, realizing that there are other prayer concerns that are out there, 
uh, other prayer concerns we mentioned in past weeks, but you continue to watch over every single one of them. And so for that, we say thank you and we praise your name today. Lord, we love you. We thank you for all this and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to read our first scripture for today. It comes from Psalm 100. And, we've, and this was a fitting psalm to, to have today as we uh, continue in worship and we consider it being Thanksgiving. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations.
Our second scripture for today comes from James chapter 4. It might help if I pull it up on the screen too. It's James chapter 4, it's verses 1 through 10. It says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet but cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think the scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? But he gives, great, he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you double-minded. What? Sorry, let me jump back. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. At this time, we have another song that we're going to um, enjoy.
this ch- time, I think our children are going to uh, make their way out to the to the back of the to the Sunday school wing, and um, I invite the rest of us to enter into a period of open worship together. we really are so blessed we're blessed to hear hear the sounds of children as they leave to to hear children in here as they uh, rejoice in you and they continue to grow and so uh, we we just see that as one blessing we see the sun coming in as another blessing and so lord i pray that as we're here today we uh, would would understand the the power of gratitude the power of knowing that you've given us exactly what we need and that you are are going to watch over us every single step of our path. That so much of the the tensions and the arguments that we face, it's, it's not things on the outside, but it's within us. And so, Lord, we pray that we might receive the grace that you have for us today, the grace that you want to pour out in our lives. And as we accept that grace, it it begins to make us new because, Lord, we are reminded so many times, amazing grace, uh, so many songs that that sing about uh, the power of grace and its ability to to call us to life. So we pray that 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 grace might be at work today in your people, that you might be speaking to each and every person where they are and that 
Uh, maybe there's just one thing that they take hold of today and it, it, it gets them uh, in, through this next week with you and they draw closer and they're just that much closer and next week they, they hear something else that we every single day, every single week are drawing closer to you and accepting the grace that you have for us that week. So Lord, help us to understand and to know uh, that you really are working all things out for our good. So Lord, we love you. We thank you for the opportunity to be together today and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. It feels like fighting seems pretty universal these days, that there, there's so many arguments and, and things that are uh, taking place that everywhere we look, it seems like arguments just abound. Uh, I, I think that we, we can go through life at times and we see people who are really just uh, problems looking for a fight, or maybe it's fights looking for a problem, I don't know, whichever way you want to word it, but, but that it seems like there's just so much argument, uh, so many arguments, so much fighting that's going on, and so I just want to take a moment for us to think about why is there so much fighting? Why, why does it seem like we have uh, so many troubles that they're just ever increasing? And, and, and I wonder as we listen to James in a little bit, might it be that we misplace where the arguments are coming from? Could it be that God uses arguments in a, in a way that, that brings about his will in our lives, that they are actually something that's useful uh, and that God is able to take them and to, to redirect our lives and orient us towards him? And so I, I want you to think about maybe you look back at the past week, maybe, and, and it doesn't have to be a big fight. It doesn't have to be uh, any, anything major, but where, where has uh, a disagreement taken place in your past week? Just reflect for a moment. Where, where has uh, a fight or, or, or disagreement, argument, whatever way you want to give it makeup and make it sound better, has there been, been an experience that you had this week? Just reflect on that for a moment. I ask you to think about that because I believe that in, in every single one of those, what's going on in our scripture today is that God is inviting us to a greater fight an even more important fight where if we pay attention to that fight and we participate in the, the, the fight that God is calling us to, we will experience true victory. And so we want to talk today about the idea of finding the real fight, finding the fight that really matters, the fight that's going to make all the difference in your life, in your marriage, in your uh, business, in, in whatever place you are. When we find the real fight, and that's where we are engaged in the real fight, if we engage that place where God is calling us to engage then God is going to do so much that we couldn't do on our own that, that we'll, we'll look back next Thanksgiving and we'll be, we'll be able to see that God has done something that we aren't the same person next year that we were this year. We, we will see God at work when we find the real fight and we get engaged in that fight. Often we see problems, we, we look around and we see problems and they're symptoms of a bigger uh, situation that's going on. Um, Mary's told me in the past, whenever uh, she was growing up, her, she was always blamed for being the one that would turn down the, the thermostat. Maybe, maybe that's where the argument, it doesn't have to be a big one, like I said, it doesn't have to be a big argument or anything, but she was always the one, because she was the youngest child, she was blamed for turning the thermostat down. I think she was just the one, she couldn't defend herself as much, and the others didn't want to take responsibility, but it, it's always that there's a bigger problem, because it was, it was hot in the house, apparently, they, they wanted it cooler, and, and so there's always something else that's going on, but it can be exhibited in little ways. And so we want to pay attention to the real fight because it's letting God uh, take us inside of ourselves and, and find the place where real victory. And that's why it matters. Because when we find the real fight, when you and I find the real fights in our own lives, not the fights that we have between other people, but the fight that's going on inside of us, that is the path to experiencing true victory as we look at what James is telling us this week. And there's three ways that we see this victory coming about. And I've said steps. I don't know that it's like a take this step and then the next step. But it's more so three acknowledgments, three ways that we need to look to God to experience true victory. The first one being that we have to recognize that the true battle is located inside of us. The true battle, we need to pay attention to what's going on inside our hearts, inside our minds, inside our lives, and, and realize that we are complicit in every single argument we take part in. Not that there isn't places for disagreements, but whenever we give ourselves over and we live lives that are just embroiled in tensions, it's not honoring to God. The second one is that we have to acknowledge that we 
are un- that we are at war with the world. That's the second level of it. It's that our, our battle is also with the world and, and with the way the world would want to shape us and make us move. And then the third fight is the fight for God's grace. To actually experience God's grace and let it change us from the inside out. And then after all that, ten, James has got ten commandments for us. There's ten commandments. I don't know if you realize we got ten commandments in our, in our scripture today. But there were ten commands that James gives to us to pay attention to if we are going to experience God's grace. If we are going to let that victory take root and take hold of our lives. Because I do believe for every single believer in Jesus Christ, God wants to give you victory. God wants for you to experience victory. And what more is there to be grateful for on this Thanksgiving but having victory through Jesus Christ? And so with that, let's go ahead and jump into our scripture and we will see uh, what James is trying to get across to us about uh, submission and, and how that works about to give us victory. <clears throat> what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you don't re- do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your own pleasures. See, our first step then, if we pay attention to what James is telling us, our first step to victory is to recognize that our most important battle lies within us. It is our desires, if you pay attention to what James draws our attention to, it is our desires, the quarrels, the fights that we have, they come from our desires that battle within us. So if we are going to be moving towards victory in our lives and victory in Jesus, we sing that song from time to time when we were able to sing, that we have victory. If we're going to move towards victory, we have to recognize that our desires are are going to cause us to, to lose the battle if we give in to our desires. And so we pay attention to it. Why does this work its way out in the scripture? Well, the first thing we see is we want what someone else has. There is a desire that's taking place in the heart of of this group of people. And I I think it's so relevant to life today. We see what everyone else has. And so we we want what they have. And and this is at its heart idolatry. When you want what someone else has to the point that you would put it above a relationship, it's idolatry. This is where gratitude is. The season of Thanksgiving and why I think it's such an important reminder as we go, we so often jump from Halloween straight to Christmas. And it's okay if you've already got your uh, Christmas decorations out. I'm not going to come to your house and, and write a ticket for, as the, the, the Thanksgiving police or anything. But as you are going uh, through, through the season, Thanksgiving is such an important reminder because it causes us to simply stop, look around us, and realize what we already have. Because if we're not looking at what we already have, we're going to be looking out and seeing what everyone else has. And if we don't have what everyone else has, we're just going to be disappointed. We're going to be discouraged. We're going to be frustrated. And we're going to take it out on any person that's around us. We have to pay attention to our desires. Because when we start wanting what someone else has, then that's where idolatry begins to creep into our hearts. I think one of the examples that that just stood out most to me in Scripture was uh, David and Bathsheba. As David in, in um, 2 Samuel, is, is, he's left there, his, his soldiers have gone out to war, and he's stayed behind doing what he shouldn't do, staying behind as the, as the king who should have been leading his army and his forces. He stays behind, and he has this moment where he covets. He sees, you, you see these things play out in uh, James's community. I don't know if someone actually had killed another member of the community because they wanted what they had, but David goes to that point. His desire takes him to the point where he has Uriah killed because his lust, his desire. It cost him in so many other ways as well. The, the baby that he conceived is going to die. His daughter will be raped. His, his, two of his sons will also be killed. There is going to be so many costs, so many problems that come out of David's inability to control his own desires our desires are so important they they make us or they break us if we are submitting our desires to God he is able to to conform them into his will and he's able to use them so our first step if we are going to experience victory is to recognize that it's the battle within that matters another thing that James tells us is that we we simply don't have because we don't ask God I mean Jesus says that, that we should ask, we should knock, and, and when we ask and we seek and we knock, we will receive. But it, James doesn't just leave it at that. He goes on just a little bit further because so often what we're asking out of is we, we ask out of wrong motives. 
This is the other thing about the battle that lies within us. We just, we just want a more comfortable life. We want to take it easy. Uh, we, we, we just want to have what we, we want to have that makes us comfortable in life. And so we pay attention to our selfish desires. If we continue to give into those things, eventually we will find ourselves separated from God and separated from other people. So our first step to victory is recognizing that we have a battle that is waging within us and Christ wants to give us victory over that. That we don't have to be victims of what we desire and what, who we are at any given moment. So continuing on, we're going to start moving into that second, uh, that second part where we can start to achieve victory. James calls out this group of people. He says, you adulterous people, going back, thinking about uh, Gomer and, and Hosea in the Old Testament. This is a people that have given up on the promises of God. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us. God wants for us to experience the fullness of our relationship with him. He, he wants for us to experience the peace, the overwhelming joy, the hope that comes with having his spirit dwell within us. But if we are going to continue looking at the world and measuring ourselves by the world around us and what we have or what we don't have, then we are going to find ourselves with enmity against God. We, we, we don't realize that there is a complete break between God and between the world around us. And as long as we continue to go back to the world and look to the world for, for telling us who we are, we're not going to accept the victory that God has given us. So the second step to victory is acknowledging that we are really at war with the world. And I'm not talking about the culture wars. I'm not talking about having, having things done a certain way or the wars that can take part in, in churches over the color of carpet or the, the type of songs we sing, but I'm talking about the war that we have at World for the souls of, of people that, that as we continue to give into the world and we look for the world and what the world says is important, we stop looking for what God says is important. When we find our real fight is, being, is the path to victory, you have to acknowledge that we are at war with the world. I love how Paul says in Ephesians 6, 12, he says our struggle is not against flesh and blood. That was that first section we were looking at. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Our, our second step to victory then becomes about acknowledging that there is a fight going on. There is a fight for our souls. There is a fight for the souls of your children and grandchildren that is taking place. And, and as we give in to culture, as we give in to, to different ways of truth and different ways of understanding the world, we move away from God. The world and God's ways are absolutely at odds with each other. They're at odds with each other. And so our second step in victory is acknowledging that we need to be taking this out. Every day, I hope that in this Thanksgiving, that you would just even take a moment to say thank you to God for having Scripture. For having the ability to open this up and to hear from him and to, to get, uh, I, I don't like, there's so many ways we can talk about uh, scripture, it can be an instruction book, I don't want to think about it as a battle plan, but uh, I think that when we come to the scriptures, as we continue to come back to God and understand how God created his world and how God intends for it to operate, that's where we find victory. That's where God is able to work and do what only he can do in your life. When we come back to this and we submit ourselves to his word. Think about it this way. And I, lo I love this image of two boats that are out on the water. Mary and I had the opportunity to go kayaking a, a little while ago. Uh, it, it wasn't necessarily. We had some of those fights and quarrels among us in that, in that time. Uh, but uh, the, And we didn't do this. We were actually in one kayak. Anyway, you get out there on the water and it just kind of floats and does its own thing. But imagine if you were to try to stand in two boats at the same time, two of the kayaks, if you were to stand up, you, you might be able to hold them together for a little bit of time. You might be able to keep your legs strong enough. But eventually, eventually, if you're trying to keep your leg in one boat and in the other boat, they're going to start to drift apart. And you're going to have to either, one, make a choice that I'm going to be in this boat or I'm going to be in this boat. Or the other choice that you're not really making but is going to happen is that you're going to be in the water. 
You eventually have to make a choice between the two boats. And for us as believers, we have to acknowledge that there is a boat that is the world and it's heading in a certain direction. And there is a boat that is God and he is heading in a certain direction. And we have to make a choice. We are not going to be able to to keep our feet planted in both boats forever. We have to make a choice. And this is going to be an important step in our path to victory as believers in Jesus Christ. The wisdom that the world is going to give you is going so often to be completely opposed to what God would say to you. Look after yourself first. Take care of you when Jesus shows us a very different way of life where he becomes the servant to everyone. He becomes the one that that loves the least of these. Even even within the religious realms of his time, he stood out and was different and they they ridiculed him. They made fun of him because the, the church... The, not the church, the, the, the faith at that time had become so self-focused and, and back in upon itself that it forgot that there were other people that God was trying to reach. And so at some point, as we're trying to navigate between two boats, I think it's just such a great image. Pay attention. Look into your own life. Where are you? Are you trying to just be in one boat or the other boat? Or are you trying to, to walk the line between both, holding them together as best you can? I'll go ahead and tell you, trying to hold them together is going to be exhausting. It's going to be exhausting, and eventually, if you try long enough, you're going to end up in the water. You can only do that for so long without being exhausted. If we want the victory that God has intended for us to have, we're going to need to be fully in his boat, fully in what he is doing in our world, paying attention to those words that Jesus taught, paying attention to the the other believers around us as they are listening to God, listening to his spirit, so that we're not pursuing after the world, but we are pursuing after God. And then the next part, it continues on. I love this word. I love this, this phrase here at the beginning because it's so important to us. But he gives us more grace. And I I just want to take a moment to apply that to everything that we've already looked at. In the fights and quarrels that have taken place, when your desires are out of control, when when you feel like you you just are are so angry at someone, when you're having all those things, or also the second part, when your desires are for what the world desires, we, we see this word, and I hope it's a word of grace, but he gives us more grace. You don't have to continue just to give in to what you've given into in the past. You can choose a new path. He gives us more grace. That is why scripture says God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. And that that word favor is also the same word for grace. It's just expressed in a different way. God shows grace to the humble. God is calling his people to be humble. Think about the example I gave of Jesus, that he was a servant. He takes on and becomes the very nature of a servant, being humble, even to the point of death. And so our third step to victory becomes actually taking time to receive the grace of God. To receive the grace of God, letting that grace come in to our lives and and begin to change us, to change our desires, to change our actions and to change our habits. And I was thinking about one of the experiences that I had recently. It wasn't quite my most finest of moments. While Marion and I were on vacation, we, we had gone, it was our last morning, we were going out for breakfast, and as we were going out for breakfast, we, we had been looking at places we wanted to go on, on this last morning, and uh, we, we get there, and I was excited about this, my favorite breakfast is Eggs Benedict, and they had like these multiple different types of Eggs Benedict that, that you could get, and we got in line, we, we read, there was a sign out there, we read the sign. And, and when, I, when I read the sign, we, we started to follow it, and then we see that people started not doing what it was doing, and, and, and so we kind of went inside, and what ended up happening in that is that I had this moment where I just got frustrated. I got so frustrated that I just flew off, and I, it was like, like a bottle rocket that went off in that moment, and, and I just didn't, at that moment, I acknowledged that I lost control. Self-control was over at that point. I got frustrated, and, and just for, for multiple reasons, and I was just like, We'll just go somewhere else. And I stormed out the door because I was frustrated. I'm gonna, and I say that because I'm realizing that I, too, need this grace. I, too, need the grace of God to, to help me overcome who I've been in the past. I, I, I know that in my, my family, one of the statements of, of previous generations is that, that, that metal's no good if it doesn't have a temper. 
And I know that I have a family. I have family that has tempers. And, and I don't have to be the, the, the person with the temper. But I can be a different person. I can choose a different path. And part of that is accepting the grace of Jesus Christ. That I can be made new. That, that maybe, there, no, not maybe. There's going to be another time where I'm going to be faced with that situation. With a, a situation similar to it. And I feel like somebody's talking down to me. And it just, that I can choose a different path. In that moment, because God is giving me the grace to experience victory, God is giving you the grace to experience victory. And part of experiencing that victory, if you look at the verse, it says he shows grace to the humble, the one who says, God, I need you. We're going to see it a little bit more as, as we go on. We, we, the humble is the person that says, I can't do it on my own. I need to submit myself to you, God. If I want true victory, if I want the victory that you intend for me, I have to have you. And, and as I think about grace, if you ever wonder, my favorite chapter on grace, my, one of my favorite chapters in, in all of the books I've ever read, probably is the first chapter in this book, The Cost of Discipleship by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He, is, uh, he was a pastor in Germany during World War II. He had the opportunity to come to America, and instead of staying in America and avoiding being put into the army in World War II, he ended up going back to lead the church during Hitler's reign, and that ultimately would cost him his life as he stood with Jews and tried to protect them, and, and eventually other things where he uh, got involved with the plot to kill Hitler because of his, his faith in God. It, it's, he's an interesting man, but anyway... I come back to this chapter because when we pay attention to this first chapter, he's talking about two different types of grace. He's talking about a cheap grace, the grace that says, oh, your sins are forgiven. Just go on and do whatever you want. He, he comes down hard on that type of grace that says you, you're free to do anything. And he's, he's instead calling us to a costly grace. He's calling us to a grace that acknowledges what Jesus Christ has done, the sins that we've committed in the past. They were inflicted upon the flesh of Jesus Christ. And so we see this quote from Dietrich Bonhoeffer where he says, such grace is costly. I think too often when we talk about grace, we make it cheap. But grace is costly because it calls us to follow. If we're going to experience this victory, it's going to cause us and it's going to call us to follow and it's grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. We're invited, church, to follow the example of Jesus Christ. We are contending for that costly grace that he's talking about. And, and we, we look at this last section of the scripture, these ten commandments. And I want you to understand that it is a costly grace. But it is how we experience God's grace nonetheless. There are ten commandments. Now, I've got them highlighted for you if you want to write down what the commandments are. James's ten commandments. Submit yourselves there then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and well. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Wow, this is an exciting conversation, isn't it? It's not what we would normally think about, but it's so important. Let's, let's keep going. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. So victory is found for us in full surrender to God. Full surrender of our desires, full surrender of our will before God, not to the will of the world and to having friendship with the world, but being a friend of God. Victory is found in full surrender to God alone. There is a world of difference in saying to God, I'm sorry you caught me sinning, and saying I'm sorry for the sins that I've committed. There's a difference in our hearts. And as we and I believe if we want to talk about gratitude, if we understand the forgiveness that God has given every single one of us through the, the, the blood and the flesh of Jesus Christ, then we would no longer desire sin. We would no longer desire to continue going back to our old patterns, but we want to be made new in the image of God. Faithfulness. When we think about faithfulness, it's often in proportion to what's happening in our lives. When we look at this idea, God is calling us to surrender everything, submit, resist the devil, come near to God. And I've kind of taken and put them together in this way. I've put them into four main categories. If we want to experience God's grace and we see what James is talking about, we first must reorient ourselves towards God. 
We reorient ourselves by submitting ourselves. And that, that word, as we look at, at submitting, it means that we let God order our lives. He takes and he sets the steps that we're going to take. He sets the relationships that we're going to invest in. We order ourselves after what he says. And, and not just that it's enough that we submit ourselves and orient ourselves towards God. We also must resist. Resist the devil. Resist the enemy, the adversary. Resist the one. And, and it's the, the idea there in the, the Greek is actually not just that. It's, it's being against. Anti is actually the prefix that goes on that word. It's, we want to be against whatever Satan is trying to set up in our lives. We want to be drawing near to God. This is our call. And I, I hope in this Thanksgiving season, you can take time to draw near to God, that you can look around you in the chaos of everything else that's happened in 2020, and you can find those reasons to say, thank you, God. To draw near to him, to say, God, I'm so grateful for how you have seen me to this point, how you've carried me through and you've delivered me in so many different moments. The next kind of idea that comes out in James's Ten Commandments are, are this idea of cleansing and purifying our hearts, that, that we are, are letting ourselves be cleansed of the sins in the past. This, I, I believe it, at times it is going to, to the, the sink and washing our hands, but it's also saying, God, I need you to cleanse my soul. I need you to wash me in only the way that you can wash me through the blood of Jesus Christ. That I need you to purify my heart where, where I'm trying to be double-minded. I'm trying to pursue after the world and pursue after you. I need for you to purify my heart and help me to, pur to pursue after you instead. So we want to go about this process of, of washing ourselves internally, letting God clean, cleanse our souls. And then the third thing that we see in there, there are four different commands that, that come out in this very, this very idea of contrition. And it's not one we talk about. If you go into a Catholic church, they would talk a little bit more about contrition. But I, I want to take some time because I think this is an important part of experiencing the grace of God. What James says in there, looking at verse 9 specifically, he says, Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. When I think about this idea of contrition, it's actually feeling the weight of our sin. Feeling the weight of what we do. And, and I remember as, as I walked out of that, that restaurant uh, on our, our vacation, I just remember feeling so guilty for what I had, just losing my cool and, and storming out. And I know Mary had to kind of follow behind me. She's like, I guess we're leaving. <laughs> I feel so sorry for her. But feeling the weight of what we chose of what we choose to do. That, that's my situation. That's mine. But think about for yourself, what, what is the weight of your choices? What is the weight of your own sins, of, of what you've experienced? I don't think we often take time to grieve over the things that we do wrong, the way we say a word too quickly, the way we hurt another person. James is calling us to grieve more and well, that we cry out to God because of what we've done wrong. We realize in that moment that it's separating us from him. And, and, and we, I love how Hebrews 12, verse 4, it, it reminds us that we haven't resisted, to, resisted sin to the point of the shedding of our own blood. Contrition, if we are going to experience the grace of God, part of the grace of God is to remove the sins from our life, not just to remove the guilt and the shame, but to actually remove what is hurting, our, hurting us. To, to remove the heart within us that, that is, is causing pain to us and to pain, pain to the others around us. Contrition, instead, it calls us to acknowledge and say, God, I, I can't do it without you. I'm not going to change. I'm not going to be the person you've called me to be without your grace. And so this idea of contrition, it should call us to cry out to God. I think it should even bring us to the point when we look at the sins in our own lives that we would, should want to vomit because we acknowledge that they are separating us from the one that truly loves us. Contrition is such an important thing for us to draw back upon as the church that we understand the weight of our sin. We understand the weight of others around us and the sins that they experience. As we take time to wrestle with the grace that God has shown us, we begin to have a little more grace to the people around us. We began to be a little more forgiving. We began to be a little more loving and understanding. When, when somebody has that moment where they fly off the handle, we can realize that there's somebody there that's hurting. 
There's somebody there that they need the grace of God. And so contrition can be a powerful way we experience God's grace. And then finally, that last command he gives us, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. See, humbling ourselves before God is letting God have control. And that's one of the hardest things for us to do as human beings because that, that's the first sin is letting God have control, letting God have his timeline. When, when we say, God, I, I think I'm going to do it my way, we're not humbling ourselves before him. We have to acknowledge that we do not know everything. And so if we're going to experience this victory that God has, and it's a victory that's guaranteed for every single one of us. It's a victory that's guaranteed for you. It's a victory that's guaranteed for every single person that you see. If we're going to experience it, it's going to require that we surrender ourselves to God. Let his grace come in. And I hope that in this season, as we go through Thanksgiving, as we move towards Christmas, that you realize that God does truly want to come and dwell in your heart. He, he does truly want for you to have that overwhelming and abundant life that, that only He can offer. It's one that the world can never offer. It's a, one that if we pursue after the world, eventually it's going to lead us completely away from God. And if anything, I look at this scripture and I think that we see that the grace that we most are in need of is our need for just God Himself. If we stop focusing on our desires battling with us, and if we stop focusing on the quarrels and fights, if we stop focusing on our own pleasures and we start focusing on God, we realize that God is truly the one that we need. We just needed something to cut through all the noise and all the different static going on in our lives so that we would see that we truly only needed God. If 2020 hasn't done anything else, it's certainly done that. It's cut through so much static to let us know what really matters. How important our relationship with God is and that we, you and I, for ourselves, we're the only ones that can, can draw that relationship closer, that it's, it's us moving towards God. And as we move towards God, he will move every other step of the way to give us his grace, to let us experience the fullness of life that only he can offer. So I'm going to invite you to stand as we close in prayer this morning. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray over you. I want to, I want to just invite you uh, where, where you're standing just to open your hands out uh, before you. And if you, if you don't want to do that, it's all right. But I just want to invite you to hold your hands out and imagine all of your life before God. You can imagine just a relationship. You can imagine uh, just your, your job or uh, just whatever part in your life you feel like is, is a place that's heavy right now. God, we acknowledge that this world can put many weights on us. Many things that will hold us back from you. And as we sit here holding these things in our hands, we pray that you, you would simply help us to see that your grace is at work on our behalf. That you long for us to be able to set down what is burdening us today. You long for us to be able to walk in newness of life. And so I pray, God, whatever it is that we've, we have in our hands, desires, broken relationships, a desire for what the world wants for us instead of what you want for us. If it's sin, Lord, whatever it is that, that is holding us back from you, I pray that we can just set it down at your feet and, and that we can reach our arms up towards you instead and, and realize that you long to hold us like, you, like a parent holds a child, that you long to hold us in love. So as we experience the forgiveness of our sins, as we experience the release of their power over our lives, as we experience the, the newness of life that only you can offer to us, I pray, God, that we would leave this place in gratitude. We would leave this place with a sense, maybe, maybe not the fullness of the victory that we have, but we would be moving towards that victory that we might experience uh, the victory that only you can give us. God, as we go from this place, just let that difference be evident on our face. Let that difference be evident in our speech. Let that difference be evident in all of our interactions this week. May we give thanksgiving for what you've done. May we give praise back to you. May we acknowledge and recognize you in every single moment of every single day, showing that we love you and we're grateful for your many gifts that we have through Jesus Christ our Lord.
So Lord, we love you. We pray that we would go in faithfulness to you. We would walk in that newness of life that you have given us. And we pray this all through Jesus' name, who has made it possible. Amen. Church family, go in peace.